Shalom Chavrin, I'm Stephen Bernoun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Bit of a prophetic segment this evening. And uh, friends, I'm going to tell you something. We're not going to be playing church tonight. I can promise you that. Uh, one just a real quick uh, note to let you guys know. On our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Uh, if you scroll down here, right there at the beginning of our news here, uh, on the right-hand side, recent articles, Kansas Conference, December, actually it's December 1st and 2nd. If you click on that link, you got a couple of things that will happen. Uh, you can go there and see a clip, a little inside look at the information we have been sharing uh, publicly. Very small clip of what's going on. Uh, also, at the top of our website, at any time, you can click directly to go to the conference website itself to where you can register for the Kansas Conference first and second. Three weeks out is all we are to that conference. So just as, just as a reminder, for more info, click on that. It'll take you there. It shows you the countdown. 21 days, 15 hours. We got three weeks till the conference time starts. You're not going to want to miss it. I'm going to try to get everything up and going as far as a, because people are asking about a schedule. It does begin for the public, the general public, at 2 p.m. on December the 1st. That's Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, all three of us, myself, uh, Brother uh, Pigeon, as well as my wife, Yana, will all speak one message that afternoon. And then again, we will open back up the door Sunday morning. It'll be an all-day affair. Uh, a lot of information be shared, but I haven't put down the itinerary as of yet on those things. And I haven't posted it as of yet. So some of you, I, I kind of know some people like uh, Dr. Pigeon better. You want to come to see him? Uh, hey, I understand that. Uh, or you might like my wife a lot better than me. No problem. So I kind of mix it up to where you kind of have to come listen to the long-winded guy like myself. Actually, I think we're all long-winded. Anyway. Let's get into the message today, guys, and, and I'm really, uh, I'm very concerned what I'm seeing going on in the world, and I, I'm so concerned that I'm afraid that we're totally missing the most important aspect of what we should be doing as believers. Those of you that uh, follow the channel, you, let's say you're a Christian, and uh, there's, some, there's many that are not. I understand that, and I appreciate you being here and tolerating listening to me go through my rants from time to time. Uh, but I'm really wanting to take a little bit of time and share with you some information here, and I think it'll be great even for those of you that are not uh, Christians. You may be Jewish, you may be Arabic, uh, or Muslim by, Muslim by faith, or another religion there, but I think it may bless you as well. So let's get right into this, because I want to talk about the goyim, the Gentiles, as we often refer to them. That's where we're going to start at, and we're going to be looking at several different passages, including New Testament as well, and looking at the events that are happening in the world. Syria, Yemen, uh, Libya, etc., Afghanistan, and taking a very serious, hardcore look at these things because I'm very, very concerned about my friends and the way we make our stand uh, whether it be politically, whether it be our standing with Israel, uh, because so many people believe that we should stand with Israel. I agree we should stand with Israel, but are we standing with Israel the way that Yeshua would have, the way that Jesus himself would have stood with Israel, and the way he did stand with Israel 2,000 years ago? Uh, let's get right into it, though. And I'm going to start right here with our father, Avram, or Avraham, Abraham. Uh, says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am God Almighty. Okay? He says uh, to, to uh, Avram, the Yomer Eliav Ani El Shaddai, okay? And he says, Walk before me and be thou wholehearted. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you or thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be the father of a multitude of nations. 
All right, now, I think this is extremely important, verse four right here, uh, and it goes on, neither shall thy name anymore be called Avram, or Abram, but thou, thy name shall be called Avraham, for the father of a multitude of nations have I made you. All right, let's look at verse four here, and this is, you're gonna understand why, it's very important. In the Hebraic language right here, he says, Ani hine barati itach, Okay, ve ha'it, ha'it, uh, excuse me, ha'it la'av hama'on goim. Now, I'm going to tell you something, friends. I've sat in many Jewish homes because I'm Jewish myself, and I have sat with many well-known rabbis, etc., but especially amongst the secular Jews, uh, they're very pro-Zionist, uh, which me and my wife were pro-Zionist at one time. And many times I uh, often hear the expression, well, Steve, they're just the goyim. It's the goy, the goyim. And we always have referred to the people that are not Jews as the goyim, the, the Gentiles, the low life, in other words. I have to tell you like it is, the low life is the way many Zionist homes think of those that are not of Judah or the Jewish nation. But we fail to recognize the fact that Abraham, when he got his name changed, he is going to be la'av, to, to father, hamo'on goim. He would become a father of many Gentiles. The same word for nation is synonymous with the word for Gentiles, goim, the goy. Goy is singular, goim is plural. Now, when we look at, say, for example, Ishmael, which was also a seed of Abraham, as the Bible clearly states, and we look at Yitzhak, who was also a seed of Abraham, God said that his promise would come through Yitzhak. But it did not change the fact that he would be a father of many goim, many Gentiles. Because you have to understand, there is only one thing that really made this part about Isaac special, and that was the faith side of it. It wasn't that God did not care about Ishmael, but he knew that through the very lineage of Yitzhak, that there would come faith. But that faith wasn't in every single child that came along through the, through the lineage of Yitzhak. Because we had Esau, Esau, and Yaakov, and Yaakov believed, and Esau did not believe. But yet it's through the same children, the same birth seed from Abraham. No wonder why Yeshua could say, you know, to the, to, to, during the days of the Pharisees, he said, you are of your father the devil. They said, ha, oh, ha, oh, we are the seed of Abraham. He said, true, you are the seed of Abraham, but you do the works of the devil. Why? Because see, God is looking for that faith, for the one that truly will believe his word. And this is the one where that when the faith comes down through. And the thing was, even Sarah, Sarah was given the test to see if she would truly believe the word of Almighty God when Yehovah was standing there in her presence and she laughed within herself in the tent behind Abraham, said, how could this be me and an old woman? Have a child, have pleasure with my Lord. Talking about Abraham. And the angel standing there with Abraham says, why did Sarah laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. He said, but you did laugh. Now see, the thing was, it was like a test. If she had a belief, instant conception. See, but even in her doubt, Ishmael was brought forth. All right. Now we know the Bible said that Ishmael was a wild man, but still God knew that Abraham loved him and he blessed Ishmael as a result. And there are many children of Ishmael that end up become later believers in Yeshua. So just because you say, oh, they're Gentiles. I say this to my Jewish friends. 
my brethren, the people of my kindred. And even in the case of the Palestinians, Palestinians are more Jewish descent or descent of the tribes of Israel than are most the other people in the world. They're more descent to the 12 tribes of Israel than most Europeans are. So they share our DNA going back 2,500 years ago. They have an exact match of a DNA to a common ancestor 2,500 years ago. That's when the house of Israel and the house of Judah were there. And if I'm not mistaken, that's even before the division of the two nations. So we are commonly related to them. Why would we oppress them then? Let alone the fact that Abraham is the father of Goim, the Gentiles, of many of them. And we totally overlook these things. Now, you know, I want to share some things with you because these things really trouble me. Now, this is Paul speaking about this over in the book of Romans. And I'll read verse 16 and 17. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the, uh, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not that only which is of the law, but that also which is of the, fa of, of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's a double L, by the way. It, it, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, or goim, all right? Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. In other words, it is still faith. The only reason Isaac, and then through Jacob, and then from Jacob through uh, through. Uh, uh, we find out comes down through the through the line there uh, uh, through David's seed comes Yeshua the the Messiah. That was only tracing the the seed that was going to be a supernatural seed because it would be a faith seed. And each individual that believes to begin with shows that they have that seed. Doesn't matter which side it comes down in that case, but in the case of the children like that, it didn't make that that Isaac was greater than Ishmael other than the fact that God knew that the faith was going to come down through that side. Because you got to remember, Isaac, right? But then Isaac produced twins. One doesn't believe, one does believe. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't, didn't make Isaac any more special. It's where the faith comes down through. Esau didn't believe. But his brother did, Yaakov. All right, and then it moved on down and down and down and down. All right, we ended up with the 12 tribes of Israel through Yaakov. But even then again, there's only one of those tribes that would produce the Mashiach, the Messiah himself. All right, now moving quickly, let's go ahead. And uh, saying, the Lord, my servant, I want to show you, because this is dealing with the Goim, the Gentiles. And Jesus saith, okay, uh, a man comes to Yeshua. He said, Jesus entered into Capernaum, and there came unto him a centurion, which, by the way, is a Roman soldier, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, uh, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another one, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, to, to them that followed, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. Not even among the twelve tribes, the very, the very tribes that had the lineage that was supposed to produce the faith that would make a Messiah. And Yeshua said he's not seen that kind of faith there, but he found it in a what? A goy, a Gentile. No wonder why God said to Abraham, you would be a father of many goim. All right? So quit underestimating the Gentile, let alone the Palestinian who may be half Gentile, half Jew. And we use the word Jew kind of recklessly. It's actually uh, Israelites. We're Israelites. We only get the word Jew from Judah, which is actually was more than just Judah. It was because the house of Judah, which in 
encompass the Benjamites, uh, the, the, the tribe of Judah, and the Levites that were living among the house of Judah at that time. Because you got to remember, Levites also went into, into captivity with the house of Israel because Levites lived in all different parts of the, of, of the uh, land of Israel at that time. Okay? Now, so we move on. This is what really gets me now. So now we kind of start looking at, we're going to start examining some of the newsworthy events in light of biblical scripture because now I've set the foundation for you that the Goim are also included in the birthright of Abraham even though the faith seed would produce the Messiah. That's the only reason why we have that faith seed that comes down through the 12 tribes of Israel and in, in reality uh, the faith seed comes right down uh, into to Yeshua, right? So now, and that's not even a Le Levitical seed, right? All right then. So let's let's listen on now. Uh, we'll start at verse eight, and and this is over in the uh, the. Uh, let's see. I am in. I forget which book I actually brought this out of. Yes, Exodus chapter 23, starting with verse 8. And thou shalt take no gift, for a gift blindeth them that have sight and perverted the words of the righteous. Boy, is this not a common practice in political circles today. Let me back up on that. Uh, thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. Keep thee far from a false matter, and, and the innocent and the righteous slay thou not. Okay, don't kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And thou shalt take no gift, for a gift blindeth them that have sight and perverteth the words of the righteous. I think Prime Minister Netanyahu would do good to remember the passage here in the book of Exodus. Right? Think about it. And a stranger thou shalt not oppress. For ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now this one troubles me the most. Not only was our people strangers during the time of Egypt, and we should have known, and this is a long way, this is <laughs> hundreds of years, or not hundreds, but uh, I'll take that back, no, that's right, this, Moses is actually speaking this. So it hadn't been too long of a period of time they came out of the out of the they're on their wilderness journey. Maybe they're out there 20, 30 years. Who, who knows the exact time? But Moses is telling them, don't oppress the stranger because you were strangers as well and you were oppressed. Now I'm going to bring it a little bit more home to the Jewish people today living in the land of Israel. Our fathers, like my fathers, your fathers as Jews. Living in Europe, many of them, as we were, and we are truly strangers in a strange land, as we were dispersed from our homeland 2,000 years ago, and we were living in other lands as well. And not only under the hand of Hitler, but under, uh, you had Stalin, you had Mussolini, uh, we had the pogroms, we've had many times that our people have been oppressed, the Inquisition, uh, it's one reason why a lot of Jews have a lot of bitterness towards uh, the Christian people is because of the Inquisition. Uh, but nonetheless, we should know what it's like to feel oppressed. Right? Our forefathers, we, we, there are still those living today that can tell us the stories of what they went through and the bitterness of the bondage uh, during the war the Second World War, and as they were being held as prisoners in Auschwitz and Dukal and, and, and many other uh, concentration camps. I've been to many of them. And I know there's debates among the number that were killed, all right? And I, I have no problem with the debate because I've read where they say there were only six million Jews in all of Europe, all right? I'm not here to debate the numbers. I know the Talmud talks about six million would die, and so therefore they're trying to justify the Talmud as some kind of prophetic book when it's not. Plain and simple, it's not. All right, but there were still hundreds of thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews that were killed in these concentration camps. And not just Jews either, there were others that were being uh, sought out. We know from Hungary, though, there, were, there was nearly, there was 800,000 from the country of Hungary alone that were killed. I know this from the very testimony of the Jews themselves, and when they're actually condemning, uh, they're condemning the very first leaders of Israel for turning their backs and allowing them to all go to their deaths. 
All right, different subject altogether. But nonetheless, as God told to Moses, we are not to oppress the stranger. Now, a stranger is not a goim. A stranger is a ger. The ger lo. See, and a stranger shalt thou not oppress, for you know the heart of a stranger. In other words, you're supposed to be able to feel for him. But you know, the problem was, those that got into power in the state of Israel did not have the feelings for them because they weren't the stranger. They were allowing our own people to suffer and die in the Holocaust and turned a, a deaf ear, as it's stated in the very books like the Holocaust, right here. The Holocaust, uh, Victims Accused, or I got another one somewhere, I think it's in my room, uh, Ben Heights, uh, 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 perfidy, and many others that are out there. Our first leaders of Israel never were the victims of the Holocaust. Now, I want to share with you something, though. I want you to hear it not just from Steve. This here is Iran Ifrati. He was on RT News. Iran has spoken out many times. His father, if I understand it right, is the chief of police in Israel, I think in Jerusalem, chief of police in Jerusalem, or former chief of police. He comes from a long lineage living in the, the Holy Land there. His, his grandfather, or great-grandfather, I believe it was, uh, considered himself a Palestinian Jew because his mother, I think, died in childbirth, and it was a Palestinian woman that, that, that breastfed him, and so therefore his first language was an Arabic language. But they were also considered a Zionist family, very pro the nation of Israel, because when the Jewish people began to migrate, he was a seventh generation, by the way, so that puts it his family in there roughly about 140, 150 years they'd been living in the land, uh, about 70 years before Israel became a nation. His grandfather fought in the liberation of Israel in 1948 because they were Jews. You have to understand, many Palestinians, there were many Jews amongst the Palestinians, or crypto-Jews as they were called. I want you to hear though what Iran Ifrati has to say here, because he too was in the military, much, much, as it, much of his family were officers in the military. And I want you to be able to hear, let me make sure the volumes are all up here because I just realized they're probably not. And uh, the thing is, is I want you to be able to hear what changed this man. And because on, I think his father's side, they had been living in Israel for about 140, 150 years. His mother's side of the family though, were, uh, were Holocaust survivors. His grandmother from his mother's side uh, survived Auschwitz, the only member of her family that survived Auschwitz. So I want you to be able to hear what Iran Ifrati has to say and what caused him to change. About two minutes of this clip here, let's listen in. Yes. Uh, so you grew up with relatives who were Holocaust survivors. Of course, there's that amazing speech of you online talking about your story. I wanted you to go over that moment that you realized how the plight of your own family related to those of Palestinians. Well, I grew up in Jerusalem in a house full of officers. I was supposed to be the next officer in line. I'm coming from a very good family in Jerusalem. My grandpa was a war hero from 48 and before 48. He also fought against the British colonial in Israel in the Irgun. My grandma from my other side is an Auschwitz survivor. All of her family were killed in Auschwitz. She's the only survivor of those family. When I was growing up with her, I remember waking up in the middle of the night, hearing her screamings dreaming about the Holocaust, dreaming about Auschwitz. And as I grew up, I understood from everybody, from my parents, my teachers, my friends, that the only way that I can stop a second Holocaust from happening to my grandma or to my friends or family is to join the army to the best unit I can and stop the second Holocaust from happening. But when I'm joining the army and going through boot camp, I'm getting ready for a war. But ending boot camp, I don't find myself in one. I find myself in the occupied territories, policing people in Hebron, El Halil, a city in the middle of Palestine, counting 180,000 Palestinians, and in the middle of it, a settlement of 800 Jewish settlers. And I'm there supposedly to protect them, but actually I'm there to put terror on people in Palestine. I'm there to police every minute of their life. I'm there to take their life and control it, to go into their houses in the middle of the night, to arrest them, children, adults, women, young men, 
take their life sometimes responding to protest to any resistance to us with a very very hard violence with rubber bullets was of course not rubber but real bullets just covered with a little bit of rubber or tear gas canister or sometimes live ammunition live ammunition that will take the life of one of the kids in Hebron at the time that I'm there I'm later after his life was taken as order to make sure that nobody from his family getting out of the home to the funeral make sure that everybody is under curfew because the Israeli army is afraid of revenge of the family and the relative so I'm there making sure that the family does not leave the house and as the father come out to understand what's going on we arrest them and when the mother of the child that our unit killed just a night before that, coming out and start screaming at us in Arabic, in words that I didn't understand at the time. I could understand every word she was saying because her screaming was exactly like the screaming of my grandma when I was growing up and she was dreaming on Auschwitz. I understood that this time I'm not the victim anymore. This time I am the colonial force in the territory. This time, if I want to continue the legacy of my grandpa against the colonial forces, I don't need to be in the IDF. I need to fight against the IDF and against Israel in the occupied territory. Aaron, th thank you so much for... <clears throat> That's a very powerful uh, statement for Iran Efrati to, to make there. And my issue is not to fight against the IDF, but my issue is to educate the Israeli people, the Christian people, the people around the world that support Israel to get our people to wake up to what the truth of to what the truth really is. It's not a matter of about fighting against the IDF, but it's to get our people to recognize humanity itself. And you know, I am a suicide bomb survivor myself uh, from 2014, excuse me, 2004 on September 22nd. You know, so I know myself exactly what it's like to live in the Intifada, live in Israel. I lived in Israel at the time, and so I understand as well. There is there has been terrorism in the past and of course it's still there is violence that is incited but we're not taking the time to really look at what's going on on the other side and we haven't taken the time to realize that many of the people that we've been fighting against are actually actually your brothers and sisters they are Jewish descent and even if they're not Abraham is the father of many Goim nations and where is it when are we going to take the true peace loving gospel of Jesus Christ Yeshua HaMashiach to the world you know this is what brings about the millennium is when we take the gospel and even now we have in America this group of people from the southern regions of, of, the, of the hemisphere, Honduras and Brazil and all those places where they're coming displaced. Why? Because America has been involved in overthrowing those nations constantly. I know how it is. I worked with the CIA. I know what we do. And it's the same thing happening. The same thing that Israel is dealing with with the Palestinians as as Irani Frati, a former IDF military man coming from a whole family of officers and things, tells you, he realized that he was doing the exact same thing that was happening to his grandmother during the Holocaust. And many Israelis are saying these things. So no, I'm not here to, as he says, I don't agree with the part of fight against the IDF. I say we need to educate Israelis. We need to educate the, the, the Israeli politician, the Israeli soldiers, the Israeli uh, people there, and especially to share the love of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. You know, and the, the sad thing is, too, my Christian friends all over the world are s blindly supporting the nation of Israel, the Zionist faction of it, and you fail to recognize that you have a huge number of believers there. I had a, I had a friend tell me one time that is Israeli, and he says to me, you know, I'm telling him that we have to recognize and stand, you know, I mean, as Christians, we have to say that we stand for the, for the, for the Jewish believers, that Israeli certain groups, the uh, Yad Lachem, uh, excuse me, uh, I forget which one, I think it's the Yad Lachem, there's an organization there that is trying to oust all the Jews that believe in Yeshua as Messiah. Oh, you evangelicals can come, you just spend your money and you go home, it's no big deal. But when it comes to those that, that, are, that are Israelis that are believing, they want to uh, take away their citizenship. 
You know, the Hyde family, we interviewed the Hyde family as an example there. Zeth Parat also speaks about the difficulties. I've got another personal friend, I can't even call his name. He said, don't say my name on the air, Steve. He said they would expel me. Went through Aliyah, he's an Israeli believer. Other people I know there, don't dare say that I am a believer. They would expel me. You know, this is totally wrong. And then when I said to the friend of mine, I said to him, I said, we have to take a stand for the Christian believers that are Jews. And, and what about the Palestinians? Oh, the Palestinians are just cannon fodder in his opinion. He didn't care if they were believers or not. See, the mindset has gone wrong. Now, Iran Efrati is one of many voices in Israel that is trying to educate and get people to understand. All right? Here's another example right here of the oppression here. Now, more than 10,000 Palestinian children ages 12 to 17 have been detained and if they're for throwing stones and stuff. Do you realize that many of these children here that you see on here can end up 20 years in prison for throwing stones? Kids! My wife, when she was speaking at the conference in Tennessee, she brought this issue up because people don't even realize this. You know, they go to a military tribunal. Children do. Now they put on there 12 to, to 17. I've seen, I can't say if there's any cases per, per se, but I have seen 10 year olds arrested before. I've seen the images of it. But yet, as my wife points out, and I'll share that with you a little bit later, as she points out, and the little boy he's got there is probably 14 years old, you know, I mean, I realize it's wrong for them to be throwing rocks, but again, what are we looking at? Just like uh, Ahit Tamimi, Ahit Tamimi, what, what, what is this girl doing? She was slapping the soldier around, but they never tell you that the, that the Israeli soldiers took her cousin only about 30 minutes before that and, ne and nearly blew his head completely off. And the Israeli government ended up treating the boy, but they made the parents sign a statement that he fell off his bicycle and that's why half his head is gone. They don't tell you these things. Friends, listen, I love my people, the Jewish people, but also I love the Palestinians. They're also, many of them, whether they're Israelite or whether they're just Goim, the Goim are also, Abraham is a father of many Goim. You know, think about it. We've got to start really paying attention to what we're doing, friends, because we're not, we're not, those of you that are that are supposed to be believers in Yeshua, we are, we are not truly carrying out the faith of Yeshua. This right here was, I just saw this on Ben Campen's uh, Twitter page there, uh, and Sonia actually reshared this as well, uh, friends that I have on Twitter there. This elderly man, he's coming up there, and he's telling to the Israeli soldiers, quit shooting the children. No, no, the little children are protesting. But again, like I said, we're not paying attention to what's going on. And this guy is up there. He's protesting what they're doing. And he's, he's willing to even get in front of the gun to try to stop them from shooting the children. And he's giving them a lecture. They're little kids. Watch. He'll go right there. He nearly gets his own head blown off with a tear, uh, or a tear canister. Then they smack him around. They, you know, what did God say? What did God tell him? What did Moses say to us that God said? Don't oppress them. Don't oppress the stranger. If you don't believe that they're of your kindred, then don't oppress them because they're strangers. Why? Because we were oppressed. And we don't take these things into consideration. And this is what's bothering me more and more. By the way, this guy right here, let me show you. Right? He keeps trying to get them to stop. He keeps getting in the way to get them to stop shooting at these kids because there's kids there in the background. Finally, a sniper takes him out, shoots him and kills him. All right, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit here so you can see it. But you'll see all of a sudden he'll fall over. It's just sad. You know? And he was shot right there in the street. Now I could tell it, was, it wasn't one of the guys standing there, and some people may not realize that, but I could hear the delay in the camera, and the sound of the camera there of the shot. So the, disc, the, the, the shooter was a little further away, but took him out. Uh, 
for the protests there. But you know, I want to share something with you here. Look at this right here. And it's not just Israel. We're talking about Middle East in general. Now I'm going to take you a little further and show you some more here. This here is in Matthew uh, chapter 15, Yeshua here. It says here, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to, to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. And then Jesus called his disciples unto him, and he said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days, and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You remember there's another time, too, where he says, you know, it talks about how they, they came for the, for the fish and the bread. But still, he had compassion. He had compassion on them that they would go away hungry. And this is a different message altogether, in a way. But when we take and we consider the situation going on in Yemen, and the other day I shared with you a picture of a little girl that was just skin and bones. She died. She died. Because we're so busy backing President Trump to make America great again. And, and I'm going to tell you something, friends. I'm, I'm a lifelong Republican. And it doesn't matter which one you put in. I'll tell you that from the days that I worked with the government. I know, I know that both sides are just as wicked. Maybe, may, maybe an independent candidate might be better. I, I don't know about independent candidates. I can tell you, though, Republican and Democrat both, they work together to smuggle drugs into this country. They work together to, to launder the drug money along with the elites of this nation. And then they work together to, you know, get kickbacks. And, you know, as God just said, don't take the gift, don't take the bribe. It blinds the eyes. Yeah, a lot of them do that. And then we take, then, then you take the extra money, you go buy all the military hardware, which, by the way, when we were sending the weapons into uh, to the Contras there in Nicaragua, we were buying the weapons from the Iranians, the Russian-made weapons, to send to the Contras. Do you think any of that's ever changed? No, it hasn't. We have funded the wars with Libya, with Egypt. We have funded all the wars to fight the, uh, the jihadists uh, in, uh, over there in um, Syria, the Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and a whole bunch of other terrorist organizations. Uh, we have been busy bringing all the, uh, the, the dope in from Afghanistan. And no doubt on military transport planes, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. And now, you know, the problem is, as I found out more recently as a journalist, which I've never told the true story about this as of yet, uh, but that will come out. We'll speak about that in the conference there in Kansas. If you happen to come there, you'll find out some more interesting things. Now they're running the dope deeper into the United States, and it ends up into the deeper interior because those coastal states like Florida and Louisiana and Texas and all that, they got onto that, you know, and it's making it a little bit harder because, you know, it's government officials and the CIA, they have to outwit FBI and other law enforcement agencies. And, of course, you know, they're not... I had one, one guy who worked narcotics uh, for most of his life in the police department said to me recently, he said, Steve, he says, you're not kidding. I saw this. He said, they actually told me one time when we had found the big kingpin of the drug deals there, leave him alone. This guy here, you're not allowed to touch. Exactly. Yeah. So then they buy the weapons and we send it over there. We give them some cash to be able to keep fighting because they're a lot cheaper, you know, and then you pay all the politicians off. Yeah. I know 30 politicians that uh, were subpoenaed, their records were subpoenaed in one of the most major drug smuggling cases in the United States of America there. And good old H.W. Bush made sure that those things were suppressed and the investigations were all stopped. He protected those 30 politicians. Some of the names would just blow you away to know who they are. Come to Kansas, you might find out. But anyway, the shame is on upon us as Americans to continue to support the wars. And like I said, I know it doesn't make any difference. If Hillary got in, yeah, the war with Yemen would have went on. And yes, she would have uh, funded, uh, took all the money from the Saudis just as much as, as Donald Trump is doing there to make America great again while we blow up the entire world. But while we're blowing up the world, Jesus was busy feeding those that came to listen to his message there. You know, maybe if we were a little bit more caring about the people that are starving in different parts of the world, maybe they would listen as well. 
maybe if we were more about healing the sick rather than doing the pharmaceutical com companies out there that are killing everybody, uh, maybe then something would happen. Maybe if we had not allowed uh, uh, people like Monsanto to take and hybrid every seed on planet Earth when God said to you, do not let every seed bring forth of its kind, then maybe we would have no famines on the earth today. But Monsanto has went in there and hybrided all the seeds and everything so that you can't make the seed to reproduce again. So the common man can't grow his own food and nobody can survive. You want to know the truth? Tune in here. If you want to know a lie, I guarantee I can give you a whole list of people that will tickle your ears tonight if that's what you want. You want to stand for truth? Support this type of work that we're doing here. Stand up and take the time to go to IsraeliNewsLive.org and support this work. That's where you'll hear the truth. Let's take a little bit more and look at some more of the Word of God here. Here's another one. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And His fame went what? Throughout all of Syria. Because of the good that was happening to the Jews... He became well known in Syria, and they, what, the Syrians, brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with the devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and healed them. What did Jesus do? He healed them. Well, let's take a look and see what we do. All right. This here is from Nicholas uh, J.S. Uh, Davies wrote the article here. Uh, this is just one of the sections in the article. I think the, the actual name of it is how many millions have been killed in America's post 9-11 wars. And this was only part three. And then we're just going to look at Syria. Estimating violent deaths in Syria. Every public estimate of numbers of people killed in Syria that I have found come, comes directly or indirectly from the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, the SOHR, which is a joke. In Rami uh, Arula Haman Conve uh, uh, excuse me, Co Coventry in the UK. He is a former political prisoner from Syria and he works with for assistance in Syria who in turn draw on a network of about 230 anti-government activists across the country. So none of them are going to give you the true story is basically what he wants to tell you in this story. When it comes right down to it, he gives you some of the some of the totals here and it ends up being in the neighborhood of uh, 353,935 according to their reports there. When he got done doing his own tallies and figures, uh, Mr. Davies estimates that 1.5 million people were killed in Syria alone. And just to give you a little picture here to get an idea, this is the way we leave Syria. And you might say, well, Russia did that. On all the reports that I found, yes, Russia drops a lot of bombs too, and believe me, Russia ain't no better, but Russia's trying to save the day for a... For a Bashar al-Assad because he needs him into power so that he can get the pipeline for himself. Russia has its own national interest. Putin never jokes around about it. He tells you it's his own national interest. With the United States and their allies, uh, Britain, uh, Germany, France, Israel, they have their national interests. And they want the pipeline to come through to be ported there in Haifa where China is helping to build the port bigger. And by the way, China doesn't care about the Israelis getting employed. They put the Chinese in there to get employed. Yeah, see what I mean? What a mess. But when the United States does their bombing, according to Mr. Davies, we wipe out entire cities with hardly no survivors. Russia trying to bomb the insurgents, and the insurgents are using the Syrian population as human shields, so Russia kills a lot of the Syrians as well. 1.5 million people, and I forget how many are displaced. Millions are displaced. That's just Syria alone. All right? So what makes no sense to me is this here. What makes no sense is Yeshua, what did he do? He healed all the sick people from Syria when they came. He didn't bomb them. He healed them. You know what, friends? It's getting time. I want. I want to play. This is that. I want to play just a little clip. Well, actually, you can watch this for yourself. I'll save it for later. Jewish believer tells it like it is. This is my wife, and when she's speaking there in Tennessee, I'll put a 10-minute clip up here for you. Some of those. 
that watched it on our channel. I only did a four minute clip, and so it was a little bit of misunderstanding in there. But just listen to the first, we'll listen 30 minutes, 30 seconds. 10, 11, they go to military tribunal for throwing rocks. And they're put in jail, held, they're, they're tried and sentenced for 20 years in prison. But this Yadla, uh, tell me the name again, Yadla Ham, yes, party, the group that Bibi Netanyahu pays money to, they will go and throw rocks on our believers. They throw rocks at their houses, they break their windows, they throw rocks at their children, they terrorize their children. There was a recent incident and they're never thrown in any prison. Isn't that interesting? And in other words, the hypocrisy in the laws. You should take a look at that. It's right there. It's here on Israeli News Live. I posted 10 minutes of this video, a little clip of her speaking in Tennessee. Many things she'll speak at in Kansas, including transhumanism, 5G technology. Dr. Steve Pigeon will be speaking there as well uh, on a number of hidden things within the U.S. government uh, that, that, that have gone on that he's been aware of, even lawsuit cases he's filed against the government. Uh, that is very interesting. A lot of, lot of information that we're going to be sharing there with you. Uh, listen, in the coming days, and again, if you want to come to the conference, uh, just go to IsraeliNewsLive.org. Uh, when you get there, the very top of our website there, you can see right there, upcoming conference, more information. Click on that. It'll take you to the website to be able to register for it. Uh, we do have, though, right there, uh, an article on there it's called the Kansas conference a little clip different clips from the Tennessee conference give you a little taste of th some of the things that we're saying nowhere near as what we're saying but a little taste uh, that I think you'll you'll appreciate but here this weekend guys I'm I, I, just pray for me because I think it's time to go back I think it's really seriously time I need to start really bringing down hard we've got to as I said, we've got to educate. We need to wake up our brothers and sisters in Israel. That's the only way this types of crimes will ever stop against the Palestinians. It's the only way that American Christians that also need to wake up and recognize that we have to support Israel with wisdom and knowledge. But I think it's time to start laying out. God has given me so much understanding over the years of who the Mashiach is. And I started on this book called uh, What Rabbis Have Missed. And it's something that is just amazing, the things that God has shown me, like the crown of thorns that he placed on Yeshua's head was a sign to Israel. See, what was it? Because when Yeshua had the crown of thorns on his head and he was on the cross and he spoke out in that unknown language. See, it was like the time when Moses met God on Mount Sinai. By, by the way, Mount Sinai means the, the word Sinai is a thorn bush. And there it was, the pillar of fire was in the thorn bush. And it was God himself from the midst of the thorn bush speaking to Moshe. And the same thing happened on Calvary. There's so many insights that he has shared with me over the years and he's made known to me to say to my people, to the Jewish people. And I think it's time to really start once again taking time here on Israeli News Live where there are many Jews and rabbis that listen to this broadcast and share these deep teachings, you know, like Joseph and David. You know, and David, amazing. Even Absalom, Absalom leaving, David leaves his ten wives behind, like the ten concubines of uh, over in the New Testament, five are wise, five are foolish. You see, he crosses the Kidron Valley. We know all this. We know that how Shimei spits on him and everything, just like it would happen later. Shimei being a Benjamite, and it was the Benjamites that was spitting on Yeshua. You know, just like in the case of Joseph, you know, so many insights that he's made known to me in the, in the case of Joseph, you know, uh, uh, just amazing things that I want to be able to share with you. The very fact of the, 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 uh, the, 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 during Yom Kippur, we have the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat. All that is tied in the story of Yosef or, or Joseph, in the story of Joseph, because why? Joseph, you know, Yeshua is truly the fulfillment of this, but Joseph, his brother, takes his coat, kills the kills the goat, pours the blood on it, takes it to his father and says, say, 
tell us who, who, who does this belong to? Is this your son's coat or no? See, what was it? That goat was a sacrificial goat, but Joseph was the scapegoat. He bore in his own body the sins of his brother, and he took them very far away from the sight of his father. Yeshua did the exact same thing. He was both scapegoat and sacrificial goat in this case here. And there's so many things, even like when Joseph takes the cup that he drinks from, he puts it in Benjamin's bag, the very brother that was innocent of any crimes against Joseph. But what was it? It was a type showing that Benjamin's own children, along with the house of Judah, would take, when Yeshua came they would betray him at the communion table and this is why the cup was placed in his back there's so many insights like this it just totally overwhelms me to even think about it we're going to start sharing those here on israeli news live try to wake up our people educate our people see don't don't go against them god knows we need a, israel does need a military but we need some education because right now we still have the zionist leaders that are taking our people in the wrong direction if you want to stand with a ministry that stands for really truth, not tickling the ears to give you mainstream media, but stands with real truth, why don't you stand with Israeli News Live? If you can't donate on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, right here, and you can see it, Israeli with S-I-S-R-A-E-L-I, NewsLive.org. You know, if you have trouble donating on the little place here on the bottom right-hand side here, you can also do this by mail. It appears here at the end of the video, our mailing address here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, or you can go to patreon.com forward slash Israeli News Live. Uh, we'll be sharing more insights there. We normally get one or two videos up a week, trying to get to where I can do about three a week. That's what I'm trying to get my goal up to there. Uh, join us over there as well. Uh, even if you're not there just listening to the information there, it's another way you can help give and it can be on a regular basis. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, Erev Tov.